think about returning the gilts to the sow farm, there's a number of major players involved in that. Um, so I think about the, the pigs, the people, um, the buildings, and the health status really as kind of the four major players there. So first of all, you're going to want your, your pigs to be reserved. So your gilt flow needs to be reserved with your supplier. If you've had to make adjustments to that, so you say you're in a disease elimination, um, make sure you continue to reserve gilts with that supplier. Um, so when you are ready to open up from your completed disease elimination, um, your maintenance project, conversion to OPG that was recently completed, you have the, the gilts ready to go. Um, they are the correct ages um, and the correct health status. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast. And joining me on this week's episode is Dr. Claire Lefebvre. Dr. Lefebvre is a veterinarian with Carthage Veterinary Service, one of my teammates right here in Carthage, Illinois. Claire, it's a pleasure to not only work with you every day, but a pleasure to get to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on and being part of the show. If you would, um, for folks that have not gotten to know you as well as I have, why don't you give the audience a little introduction? Sure. Thanks, Clayton. Happy to be back on the podcast. Um, I am originally from Wisconsin, so a Wisconsinite at heart. Um, still have a love of cheese curds, which I have not been able to find in Illinois as easily as Wisconsin. Um, but I'm a graduate of Wisconsin um, and have been at Carthage with the Carthage Veterinary Service team since 2017. Um, as you said, primarily work with Carthage System sow herds, but also um, independent clients as needed as well. Claire, you do a ton of work with sow farms. Um, and uh, I know one of the things that you have uh, spent some time on is helping to protect the gilt flow into sow farms. Gilts are obviously critical for sow farm performance for many, many reasons. However, um, there are a lot of reasons why your gilt flow can be disrupted coming into the sow farm. Disease elimination projects, natural disasters like windstorms and tornadoes that you know force us to do repairs, or maybe even a planned repair. A producer that's switching to open pen gestation to Prop 12, you know, uh, just somebody who needs some repairs on the barn and they don't have space to bring gilts in. Um, you want to talk to us, Claire, about your experiences with trying to restore gilt flow, what are the key steps in there and what are the landmines you really want to look to avoid when you're working on that project? Yep. Um, you think you covered all of the, most of the reasons why you would interrupt gilt flow, Clayton. Um, but when I think about returning the gilts to the sow farm, there's a number of major players involved in that. Um, so I think about the, the pigs, the people, um, the buildings and the health status really as kind of the four major players there. So first of all, you're going to want your, your pigs to be reserved. So your gilt flow needs to be reserved with your supplier. If you've had to make adjustments to that, so you say you're in a disease elimination, um, make sure you continue to reserve gilts with that supplier. Um, so when you are ready to open up from your completed disease elimination, um, your maintenance project, conversion to OPG that was recently completed, you have the, the gilts ready to go. Um, they are the correct ages um, and the correct health status. Or if you're switching genetics that you've, you've vetted that um, genetic source with a vet to vet call um, with, this, with the new source herd veterinarian. So uh, that kind of covers the pigs. Um, correct age, health status has been um, vetted. Um, it's it's det determined to be acceptable. The next uh, thing that I think about is really the the uh, the buildings. So if you've done a maintenance project, you know that everything's been cleared out. It's acceptable for pigs. Um, you'll want to do a walkthrough, uh, make sure there's no you know organic matter left. If it was a maintenance project, sharp edges, everything like that's been taken care of. Um, all the equipment's been removed. Um, and then that building needs to be washed and disinfected and really um, inspected to make sure that it's it's appropriate for pigs. Um, one thing that I always put on my checklist as well is making sure ventilation um, is working. So backup systems, um, fans and lights. Um, there's always improvements that can be made to lighting in old barns as, as far as I'm concerned. Um, make sure all that's you know up and ready to go. Um, so that's uh, the building aspect. 
Um, and then the people aspect. So when you're thinking about moving guilt back um, from a source that really involves a, a lot of people, um, you know, coordinate coordination with your genetic supplier uh, is a big one. Um, next would be your logistics team. Who's hauling those pigs? Um, you'll want to make sure that you know and are comfortable with the truck wash status of where those trucks are coming from, the downtime on those trucks coming to your site, um, and then the the driver biosecurity as well. Um, there's been a lot of light shed on on driver biosecurity and cab biosecurity within the last couple of years um, that really needs to be a part of that overall consider consideration for transport. So your pigs are on the trailer, uh, they're coming to the sow farm. You also need to make sure that you have team members at the sow farm that know how to, how to place gilts into a facility. And when I'm talking about the sow farm, I'm really referring to a, an on-site GDU. This could be an off-site GDU as well. Um, depends on the, the system or the company. Uh, but those people need to be trained in, in how to, to handle gilts and how to stock them and how you're going to do an, an on-site breed project if you're breeding in there. Um, those are all nuances that are particular to uh, resuming a guilt flow, um, whether that's on or off site. Um, but you'll, you'll want to have your folks um, trained and, and ready to, to know how to heat check and those types of items. So kind of in summary, Clayton, I've got I've got four items that I really look at. So your your health source, um, you know, you want to make sure those pigs are healthy, uh, the pigs, um, the people involved in that and then the the building inspections that I went through. Claire, I know uh, a lot of producers will have maybe an isolation barn and it is built for the size of animals they're bringing in, the weight of animals they're bringing in, whether that's a wean gilt or a feeder pig gilt, or maybe even a select. And it's built for the number of those animals that they would normally get. So I've got an isolation barn. It's a, you know, a nursery that'll hold a couple hundred gilts at a time or something like that. But when I've had a herd closure, I've got to bring in gilts of multiple ages. And some of those uh, some of those round peg gilts don't fit in the square peg of space that I have available, right? Any tips for producers in that situation where maybe they can isolate, but they're going to have to isolate in a part of the barn they don't normally isolate. You know what I mean? Uh, they don't necessarily have a shower into that part or it wasn't quite designed the way we would uh, ideally want for isolation. Any tips or tricks on how a producer can think through still trying to isolate and quarantine yet at the same time being realistic about the facilities I'm doing it in. Right. I think, I think it's important to be realistic and recognize your limitations. Um, any layers that you can add between an established population and the incoming guilt flow, um, regardless of facilities are beneficial. So say you have an isolation barn, but you know, it's a, it's a two sided, two sided grower finisher barn, if you could lock down and put separation on half of that barn um, and enter from the outside and keep that foot traffic separate, um, that is beneficial. Um, what we don't want to do is put animals directly into the sow farm if we can avoid that. Now, I know that's not always possible. Um, if a farm needs to make target and you're testing before you're moving those pigs, and you're testing the sow farm, um, a lot of times that does happen in the industry. Um, however, avoid that if you can. Um, it is a risk to the sow farm health status. Um, but just layer, think about your layers of separation. Like I said, Clayton, you can you can place, um, you know, if you can Danish change into an area of the barn, um, separate boots, um, any layers that you can to avoid pigs having nose to nose contact or mixing directly with each other are beneficial. How about the testing side of things, Claire? Um, assuming that you can isolate somehow, some way, and that there's going to be a testing hurdle for those incoming gilts before we open the doors to that um, normal or and or temporary quarantine area. What's a normal testing schedule? So assume, yep, we can put them in the normal way. Uh, what would be Claire's recommendation for kind of normal industry standard quarantine testing um, in a general sense, right? Um, I know it can depend on the number of animals and that sort of stuff, but generally, what do you think of for normal testing? And then let's say we've got one of those situations, Claire, where I've got to stick those gilts directly into the main farm. Um, any recommendations on the testing of the source farm for the gilts that you might change prior to delivery in that situation? 
So for uh, as, you, as far as routine testing schedule, Clayton, um, a lot of this will be based on the fact that the source herd is known to be and actively testing for um, PERS, PD, uh, Delta coronavirus, TGE, um, and mycoplasma hyaluronemia, known to be negative for all of those. Um, once those incoming guilts are received, I will typically test them off the truck um, around five days after they arrive. Um, some folks will range that from three to seven, but I, I typically like to, to stick with five, especially, you know, if you got a weekend in there, um, you, you're realistically not going to get your samples to the lab on Monday. Um, so they will be Tuesday sometimes before they get there. Um, so I usually stick with uh, a five day uh, first testing just to rule out any major players that would show up um, relatively quickly like PED um, or Delta. So that would be my first testing. Um, you could also test them for PERS on PCR at that time, but anything picked up in transport potentially would not show up on a, a PERS ELISA at that point in time um, if they were truly infected during the transport movement. Um, now, before putting them into the South Farm, I would additionally test a second time. Um, so at 14 days, not before that, typically, um, I would run some additional PERS PCR testing um, and ELISA testing at that point. Um, if they were infected during movement, I'd expect, you know, ELISA to, to come up and be positive around that 14 day mark. And that would help me determine uh, when those animals were infected, if it was during movement or um, coming potentially from the source herd, um, things like that. So that that would be kind of a routine testing movement. Um, now, there are, are one-off scenarios, as you said in the introduction, you know, there's a number of factors that can alter guilt flow on uh, a sow farm, and some of it isn't perfect. Uh, so if you know that you have to make a somewhat riskier move um, and don't have the, the option to isolate those animals, um, you can increase your testing at the source herd um, to increase the sensitivity. So whether that's bleeding more animals to increase your confidence levels, um, or you know, testing all the pens on oral fluids to make sure you cover all the all the um, animals that are going to be moving with uh, ropes. You can do that. Um, any additional testing is going to add cost, so just be cognizant of that. Uh, but usually, if you're taking a risky move, you're you're more than willing to occur the increased cost on the front end of that to avoid anything happening in movement. Um, but just be recognize that those all play a part in um, increasing the, the testing and, and desired sensitivity at the, the sow herd level before um, any maybe undesirable guilt movement that needs to be established to maintain breed target at the sow farm level. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. Claire. Awesome information. Uh, you and I could probably chat on this for forever, but unfortunately, we gotta we gotta wrap it up here. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing that, Claire. It's really practical, and I think it really helps an industry that is uh, working to clean up disease all the time and has had a heck of a lot of natural disasters here this spring, uh, with you know tornadoes, high winds, derechos, uh, you name it, hail. Uh, I think this is really practical for a lot of the audience. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, Clayton. Thanks to our audience. Uh, we certainly couldn't do this without you. Um, if you've not checked out the website, please go to swinehealthblackbelt.com. Uh, you can access our, our old videos there, our old audio. Um, if you're listening to this on podcast format, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please go ahead and sign up so that you hear not only Claire's next episode, but all the ones we push out every Friday. For Dr. Claire Lefebvre, my name's Clayton Johnson. Uh, we've really enjoyed spending time with you here, and we hope you have a great rest of your day.